If you are in academia and used to writing academic research papers or in business and used to writing business memos, do you know how to write a statement of purpose, which is mostly about you and your future and not an academic interest? Our guest today is a PhD student in English, a writing instructor, and an expert in advising applicants on writing statements of purpose and scholarship essays for graduate study. She'll tell you how to approach this vital and different genre of writing. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Acceptance founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 473rd episode of Admissions Straight Talk. Thanks for tuning in. The challenge at the heart of admissions is showing that you both fit in at your target schools and stand out in the applicant pool. Except it's free download, fitting in and standing out, the paradox at the heart of admissions will show you how to do both. Master this paradox and you are well on your way to acceptance. You can download this free guide at acceptance.com slash F-I-S-O, as in fitting in, standing out. Again, you can grab your free copy at acceptance.com slash F-I-S-O. Our guest today, Vanessa Febo, is a PhD candidate in English literature at UCLA. She graduated from the University of Michigan with a bachelor's degree in English and then worked in business for several years. While pursuing her PhD at UCLA, she has taught writing to undergraduate students and assisted graduate students in getting major grants and scholarships, including the Fulbright, Stanford Knight Hennessy, and the Ford Foundation Fellowship. She has also guided students to accept it at top programs at Harvard, Stanford, USC, and others while an accepted consultant. Vanessa, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Now, how did you get involved in coaching applicants in the writing required for admissions and grant and scholarship applications? Yeah, so I, as you as you stated, um, was an English major, and I knew that I wanted to pursue a PhD. And I wasn't sure what that entailed necessarily at the time. I don't think anyone necessarily is going into a PhD program. But I discovered a lot of it was teaching and I really loved teaching and a big part of teaching in the English curriculum is obviously working with students on their writing, which we're not necessarily fully trained in. So I got additional certification in writing pedagogy as well. And because it was, I realized that writing is such a foundational aspect of that and we're not, we, I needed to pursue it extra training. And then I managed to get a job at the Scholarship Resource Center at UCLA, which is a very unique center because it's one of the only of its kind in the country. We help students. Yeah, it's really surprising to me that more universities, especially private ones that have such so much money to, to, you know, could do a center, don't, but we're one of the very few that actually help students. It's not part of financial aid and just the grants loan process, but we actually help students work on applications for scholarships. So through that, I had the opportunity to work with students on what we might call national merit or nationally recognized international scholarships as well, because that is operating through that office. And I worked with Dr. Rebecca Bluestein, who Mm. um, spearheads that at UCLA. So Mm. I've been involved on selection committees for scholarships um, through that office for in-house scholarships and for things like uh, Phi Beta Kappa, the National Honor Society. I was recently on their selection committee for that, um, that just finished. And I've worked with students with both interviewing and essay writing for for all sorts of scholarships, large and small. Um, So that's kind of what got me started. And then I branched out into more statements of purpose and for applications. Great. Okay. Let's let's we're going to get back to scholarship essays in a minute. Yeah, I'd like to focus more on the statement of purpose since Mm -hmm. I think everybody listening to this is going to have to write a goals essay or statement of purpose or a personal statement. Yeah. What's the first step applicants should take when they're thinking about writing one of these essays? Yeah. So I'm going to give an answer that's going to sound really simplistic, but I'll explain why it's actually really important. Okay. My answer is always read the prompt. 
And I'll explain why that sounds, well, yeah, duh. First off, it's not always obvious that there is a prompt. And usually the prompt, there's usually additional information on application web pages or on a school's page that feeds into the prompt. They might state what type of applicant they're looking for in a different section of the web page from the actual prompt itself. But I always consider these additional information part of the prompt. So that's part of it is gathering all of that information together and seeing what they're actually asking for in an applicant and what they want, what information they want to know about you. And then the second is it really directs everything about the way your essay goes. It can really shape the entire structure of your essay because some prompts are much more forward looking, so much more interested in what you plan on doing while in the program, and, and most are this way, what you plan on doing in the program, what you plan on doing afterwards, career-wise, short-term and long-term, right? What are your future, future goals? But some are a little bit more backwards looking than others. So some care a little bit more about you spending a lot of time on your accomplishments. So it really determines the outline for your entire essay. So you really can't get started until you have an understanding of what they're looking for. And so that means underlining and close reading that prompt. <laughs> I know sometimes I'm asked, you know, what do the students really want? Yeah. Like they really want the answer to their question. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, that's so, why they put it there. <laughs> exactly. So whenever I'm doing the final checks on a statement of purpose or a personal statement for a client, my steps besides spelling and grammar, the third thing I always do is reread the prompt and reread the essay and make sure the essay answered all of the questions in the prompt. And you'll be surprised. I mean, at that stage, usually it, it does they answer the question because right. we've gone over it so many times. But certainly the first draft most of the time is missing many of the questions. And that's not a product of bad writing. That's just a product of the writing process, right? Where you have to get to that place where you've thoroughly addressed all of the questions. So yeah, you know what it's so key. Yeah. <laughs> in, this, in this direction, I'll read the essay. Then I'll read the prompt and I'll see if I can answer all parts based on what I just read in the, in the essay. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So asking the questions, you know, so what is your future career if, and also sometimes it's answered, but so briefly, but if the question they're asking is very detailed. So if they say, what's your future career? And they want to know X, Y, and Z about it. But you only just briefly mentioned that you want to be a neurologist. <laughs> you're, you're, um, you maybe didn't dedicate enough time to that aspect of the question. Right. So it's also sort of a proportion thing as well. Yeah. Right. Good point. Really good point. Uh, let's say someone is applying to a program that has more than one essay, like many MBA programs, mm -hmm. medical school to be sure. How should they divvy up their material? Again, would the, would the questions be the guide? Would the significance of the events or experiences be the guide? Any, any guidance there that you can give? I know this is a really general question. No, that's a really good question because I think that's a very common frustration with people applying to MBA programs, but other programs that ask for multiple essays as well is, well, I already went over my life story. How do I do this again and not just repeat myself? Right. And so one thing is absolutely looking at the prompts side by side and seeing how they differ. So really doing a comparison. And the second is to keep in mind that all elements of an application are complementary. So you want to think about the application as a whole and so one step might be if you've already completed one essay and it answers the question is seeing what isn't being talked about in not just your essay, the first essay, but in my resume or in if they ask for a cover letter sometimes too, or in other materials that I can really dedicate this essay to. So sometimes it's a really great opportunity of course, answering the prompt to get in additional experiences that you just didn't have a chance to talk about. That was a great response. Thank you. How can applicants deal with writer's block? They're staring at the blank page, <laughs> the blank screen, and they got this prompt and yes, they've gone over it, but what now? So the first step of writer's block is understanding that everyone, including professional writers, including myself, when I'm working on my own projects, experiences writer's block. The second is 
really a strategy of breaking it down into much more smaller manageable chunks. So sometimes when I'm working with a client and they just, you know, they're not either not really not comfortable writing, I'll give them, you know, we typically give outlines to clients and help them, or if you're working on your own and you construct an outline, make the outline a series of questions and then that are based on the prompt and really you can just then answer your questions. And that's a really simple way to kind of get started. And the other thing to keep in mind is especially in initial stages, you're really just trying to get that information down on the page. So if you're thinking, I don't think this should go here, don't worry about that, <laughs> we're not there yet. It's really much more important. It's much more crucial to have that information in the essay, especially in early stages, um, which is typically when people experience the most writer's block because they don't have anything on a page yet, than it is to, you know, to try to figure out exactly where's the perfect place because it's going to be edited anyway, um, by, by yourself and by, potentially by us. So that's what I would say is just, you know, it's the first draft. It's okay to be a crappy draft <laughs> as well. And just get the information on the page. And if you can tell yourself that, I think it takes a lot of the pressure off. Right. I agree. Now, many of our listeners are in academia or mm -hmm. they've done research papers. Mm -hmm. uh, they might do research for work. What are some of the differences between a statement of purpose, which is one of those more forward oriented pieces mm -hmm. of writing mm -hmm. and a research paper? Yeah, that's a really great question. And it's something that comes up a lot because the statement of purpose is a really specific genre of writing. And it's a genre that even people whose academic careers required a ton of writing are not usually familiar with because it is not a research paper. And the difference really lies for a statement of purpose. I would compare it, the closest thing is a research proposal because you're talking more about what you plan on doing in the program and in the future. But even then there's differences because in a research proposal, you might only be focused on the research outcomes typically. I would say that's the case almost all the time. You're not really thinking in personal terms. But a statement of purpose is a little bit more hybrid because you want to talk both about your personal sort of professional outcomes that you're looking for in terms of your career goals, skills you want to learn, the type of professional you want to grow to be, in addition to research outcomes. So it's a combination I found is the most successful because they want to know both how you will contribute to the program in terms of your research, but also how you are going to participate in the program and grow within the program. So mm -hmm. that, that I think is the biggest difference. And what about the difference between, let's say, a statement of purpose or a different kind of application essay mm -hmm. and a business memo? Yeah, so business memo, the, again, the question is being personal. So a statement of purpose, you might talk about failures and what you've learned from an experience in terms of, you know, this experiment failed five times. And I learned not only these technical things, but I learned to rely on my lab partners and my PI. I learned that that is a part of the process of this project that I'm working on. And so those aren't things you wouldn't include in other types of documents because it's personal. To give a business example, I just <laughs> we're talking about this. Um, it, it, you wouldn't you would talk about outcomes, deliverables, but you wouldn't necessarily in a business memo talk about personal deliverables, if you will, or the personal lessons learned from a project. Right. Um, Personal not, lessons learned. Exactly. Like, what did you learn from this experience? You know, the business memo, <laughs> that's really not the point. The point is the outcomes, the deliverables, the what the corporation learned, maybe. maybe. Right. right. But maybe. Not, not, or the team learned, maybe, but really not personal. So right. I think that's a big difference. And one of the things I think students also struggle with, I mean, schools always say, we want to meet you through these essays. I just attended mm -hmm. the AGAC Conference Association of International Graduate Admissions Consultants Conference last week online. And many of the school representatives who are mostly from business schools said, we're hoping to meet you through your applications. We want authenticity in the applications, but you know, yes, you can get personal, but not too personal. Yes. Uh, and 
the question becomes, A, what is too personal? But even more than that, how can you be authentic and maintain your own voice and not, let's say, descend into texting, social media writing, and just <laughs> casual writing? Kind of where's, where's that line? Yeah, it's a really great question. So the question of this sort of more casual side of things mm -hmm. really comes down to recognizing that this is a formal document that you want to treat as a professional. So when you enter into graduate school or whether that's grad program or an MBA program or any kind really of advanced degree program, a huge part of it is professionalization. So from the start, they want to see that you would fit in as a colleague, not as a student. So it's a really big difference from sort of the way of thinking in undergrad. So that's part of it. So that's why it's important to be a little bit more formal than you would in your everyday speech. And really that is just, those conventions are really basic. They're, they're the kind of things that you know from writing a cover letter, you know, avoid yeah. contractions if possible. No emojis. No, exactly, no emojis or pictograms, um, you know, make sure you're following standard grammar rules. And it's also, you can think about it this way, it's also about being able to communicate. So if you're speaking in a lot of slang, and this also goes for tech jargon or even business jargon sometimes, they might not understand you. You have to know who your audience is, you know? Because yeah. it's going to be professors who don't speak in emojis. <laughs> Likely, <laughs> older. <laughs> um, and then as far as being too personal, I always say that it's constructing a narrative about your life, but it's not your whole life. It's about- have to spill your guts. <laughs> yeah, I was born in a one-room school cabin. That's not, the, that's not the kind of story you're telling. You're talking about the in moments in your life that led you to this particular field of interest and to maybe even your particular research interest, or definitely to your particular research interest. Or if in the business, if you're in the business world, you're talking about moments in your life that led you to this particular area of business and to want for you to want to develop that type of expertise. So that's very niche. That's not what you the science experiment you did in high school is not relevant. <laughs> you know? And yeah, likewise, the personal <laughs> crises may not be relevant. Either. And exactly. So sometimes it is important to talk is. about challenges that you experience in your life, yep. but only if it's relevant to your schooling. So only if it explains a situation that's occurring else that you're seeing on a transcript, for example, or, you know, if it explains your shift in direction from one field to another, but so it is appropriate sometimes to get personal, but it's also how you talk about it. So a lot of students who have traumatic experiences are worried about sort of trotting them out as fodder or feeling used when they write these those types of essays and they want to include that experience because it's relevant, but they're afraid to. But I, I, what I always direct students to and clients to is that you have in your essay control over how you describe those experiences. And a good rule of thumb is to dedicate minimal time to explaining what happened and more time explaining to how you grew from it, changed from it, what kind of impact it had, you know, hopefully positively, um, silver linings and all that on the direct directory of your life. So. How it strengthened you. Yeah, exactly. Resilience is a big buzzword, but it's also a really important aspect because PhD programs are grueling. These careers can be grueling. <laughs> and again, also in the business world, they want people who are resilient. So showing resiliency is a good thing. And you do that by talking how you move forward about how you move forward. Yeah. You want to, if you're discussing a traumatic or difficult experience, you want to show that you're stronger as a result not that you're somehow damaged goods. It was a, the pity essay is out. And I think that is a very positive thing because I think the pity essay can be exploitative of the people who are applying because it's saying, what happened to you? How, how sorry should we feel? And then you're in an, a competition with other people to see um, about traumatic experiences. And that is a really terrible way to evaluate who is good for a program. Right. I think a much more important and relevant thing is, is exactly that to talk about lessons learned, to talk about survivorship, you know, so I think it's important to acknowledge that, <laughs> that, you know, 
sometimes the success of a traumatic experience is living through it. And you can also be ambivalent about that, you know? <laughs> and I think it's fine to be honest that an experience wasn't ultimately a positive good. I think that's also kind of disingenuous. Yeah. I when mean, horrible you know, happens to you. There are many times you say, I'd you rather know? be stupid or I'd like, I'd rather be weaker and not have gone through that. Exactly. But well, I did go through it. I can't but you did. The end, and this is the result. And this is who I am today. And yeah. I think it is important sometimes to talk. It is important to talk about it because it is a big part of who you are. And they do want to know that. But again, we're always thinking like I'm making an autobiography or I'm making a narrative about my life, but it's tailored to a very specific direction right. <laughs> and Great audience. Point. Great, point. Great point. Yeah. What are a few of the common mistakes that we haven't discussed that you see <laughs> applicants make with their essays? A big one, I think, is treating, as we talked about, treating a statement of purpose as a business memo or as a project proposal. And also, I would add to that just like a cover letter, the old fashioned cover letter, where you're just listing what essentially boils down to is listing. So if you're just listing everything you've ever done, you're not crafting a narrative and you really want to be crafting the narrative. So you want to be selective about what you include because this is your chance to highlight what your best accomplishments, not talk about absolutely everything. So that's one thing. <laughs> and then I think the other thing is the jargon issues. And this is just a reflection of the fact that you've developed some expertise in a field. So you can assume when you're applying, you know, to a, an engineering master's science program that the people reading it will have engineering degrees. So there is a level of expertise you can absolutely assume. However, they may not be specializing in robots. <laughs> so if we're going to talk about maybe they're software engineers. So maybe there are elements, so there may be elements that they are not specialists in. So it is important to keep in mind that there's a general degree of expertise you can expect from your reader, but there may be, you may want to explain some terms and spell out some of your acronyms, <laughs> at least the first time you use it. At least the first time, exactly. <laughs> Great advice, thank you. All right. So, all right, let's go back to the scholarship essays now. Yeah. How would scholarship essays differ from statements of purpose or an application and how mm -hmm. are they similar? They're very similar in a lot of ways. The, I think one difference is that scholarship essays can differ so wildly. Generally speaking, an admissions essay for a program, you can expect them to want to know how you're going to fit into the program. And you can expect that they want to know about your career outcomes and your career aspirations related to the degree you're going to get. So it's pretty straightforward. Scholarships can sometimes be a free for all. It can be anything from a philosophical question they ask you about a specific book. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had essay, you know, where a student had to read a, a student or a client had to read a book for an essay for a scholarship. They can be much more personal, and frequently that is the case. So we were talking a lot about your personal experiences and how to delicately include those in essays. And that's an issue that comes up way more frequently in scholarship applications, because sometimes they'll directly ask you about those, questions, those kinds of questions. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, let's, let's say an applicant has the essay down on paper. They yeah. revised it. Yeah. Should they show it to others? Whom should they show it? And how many of those <laughs> others should they show it to? I don't think you should show it to every single person that you know, because that can what be- What about all your Facebook friends or Instagram? <laughs> Facebook Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> the reason is for your own sanity, because the point of showing it to someone is that they give you feedback. And Feedback, first of all, from a psychological perspective, is difficult to hear. So you need to be selective of really the quantity of feedback you're receiving. <laughs> um, you don't want to overwhelm yourself or get really upset because you feel like it's so hypercritical or something. And then the second is you want different types of feedback. So for example, working with us, we are looking at the structure, the writing, the quality of the writing. We are expert, generally speaking, accepted in understanding how different programs work and how admissions works and 
what they're looking for and being able to interpret those prompts, et cetera. But, you know, you may get, uh, there may be a professor who was an expert on the project that you worked on with that professor, and they would be really great to show the essay to, to speak to the technical aspects, to make sure that you're, when you do use your jargon, that it's correct, that you are describing your project accurately and your outcomes accurately. So I think that's, that's a really especially valuable one. If you have sort of a professor or someone who's in the field to check for accuracy and sort of to gauge okay, is this as innovative as I think it is and making sure that it's not basic, that it's specific enough. And you do kind of want, you might want, to, it's really beneficial to have an expert to do that, um, a professor. And then you might just want someone who's a complete lay person who, who knows nothing to read the essay. So this might be a family member or friend. Maybe they, they know them though, they know the applicant. They know them and to say, does this sound like me? Does this yeah. sound like my voice? So I think being selective and just choosing people for different types of editing questions. So say, hey, friend, I would like you to read this. Tell me, does this sound like me? So they're not going to correct your grammar spelling. Maybe they will, but they're not going to worry about the technical jargon. They're just going to see, does this sound like me? Um, and then the professor, you can say, hey, you don't need to read this <laughs> for yeah. style and give me a line edit, but can you tell me did the way I said, describe my project sound correct? So great feedback. Yeah. How do you recommend an applicant effectively proof and edit their essay? So they ask for the feedback from the professor. They ask for the mm -hmm. feedback from a close family member mm -hmm. or friend whose judgment mm -hmm. they trust and they get the feedback and let's say they feel it all has merit and they incorporate the feedback. Mm -hmm. How can they effectively proof and edit it? I'll yeah. hire us, but, but, but besides that. <laughs> yeah. So, so first off, getting an expert to look at it is a really good idea. <laughs> I do think it is definitely beneficial. But generally speaking, the first step is really to go through item comment by comment and incorporate that into the essay. And don't worry too much at that stage about line edits, grammar, spelling, all that jazz. Once you're at that refining stage and you're really trying to polish the essay, you might do a couple of things. In terms of structure of the essay, you might do a reverse outline, which is where you take the essay as it is and you look at the essay and you make an outline based on the essay. So you can see where everything is and get a sense if it's proportionally right to the questions being asked, if you answered all the questions and things like that. So that's like a structure trick. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of grammar and spelling and stuff like that, it's really about getting as much visual distance from the paper as possible. So printing it out, <laughs> classic one, printing it out, reading out loud. I recently have been really employing on Word, there's the ability to have the robot voice read the essay for you, wow. like read aloud function. I love that. It's really great because it cre it catches things that aren't spelling errors that you might not see. So you might have written goat instead of great and goat is spelled correctly. So it's not catching it and you didn't catch it because it's so similar. Right, right. <laughs> but the robot will read goat <laughs> <laughs> and you will catch it. I didn't even hear about that. So it, <laughs> yeah, it catches things like that. And then just rinse and repeat. And then the thing that's the hardest, walking away, taking a break putting it away. You need distance from the essay in order to see it clearly. Great suggestions. Yes. They're both, they're both, you know, that I'm a big believer in printing it out, taking yes, breaks I, and all that. I am, I am with you. I am a hot team printed out because it really does change. I'll sometimes go move to a different location to read the printout because somehow that just changes things. And reading quietly and reading out loud too, I think is so great because I'll read it out loud, sounds fine. And then I start reading it in my head quietly or, you know, without really? speaking. And I'm just, this sounds weird, <laughs> it sounds off. You know, it's, it, there's a huge difference. And yeah. it's kind of, you know, you want to employ as many of those kinds of techniques as you possibly can. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you wish I would have asked you? What would you like listeners to know about running these essays, either scholarship or application? One underrated thing that I think we don't talk about is the difference between a personal statement and a statement of purpose. Go for it. Which is a little bit of a subtle distinction, but we talked about backwards and forward facing 
yeah. essays and a personal yeah. statement is, and these sometimes are either some, we talked about second essays too. Sometimes there'll be a statement of purpose and a personal statement. And I might not call it that, but that's what, what, what it is. Right. So the difference is a personal statement is much more backward looking. It's how your experiences shaped you into the person who is pursuing this type of project, wanting to go to this type of school, complete this program, have this career. So it's how you became the person you are at present. You will also talk about the future, but it's much more focused on that formative process of how you came to be who you are, who is ready to engage in that program and hit the ground running. A statement of purpose, as we talked about, primarily in this podcast today is much more forward thinking. So it will touch on those formative experiences, usually in the terms of projects you've done that have, are leading up to what you wanna currently work on. But the majority should be of the essay will be focused on what, are you, what work are you planning on doing while you're in the program, both in terms of the project um, that you wanna work on or experiences that you wanna have professionally and sometimes personally, how you wanna get involved in the program. And maybe and professors then, you wanna study with? Professors you wanna study with, organizations you might wanna join. And, and MBA programs really want participation particularly. Mm -hmm. So that's a good tip for MBA people is, ta is looking at the professional organizations and opportunities and saying, I wanna take advantage of all this is to offer in this program. And I'm I wanna contribute to it. I want to contribute. It's both. It's both. I want to be involved. <laughs> and I'm part going, of the community. I want to be a part of the community. And that's actually something I'm really looking for. So, and then future career. So what, do you, what kind, how do you want to start out your career and where do you see yourself in the height of your career? What is your end goal I'm at apex of your career? And so not all of that might be in a personal statement. Right. And you can tell the difference again, in terms of the prompt, are they asking you about your past? Or are they asking you about your future? So that's something to watch out for because a lot of people conflate the two essays and they are very different. They are, absolutely. And of course, your, the importance of uh, looking at the prompt is can't, can't be overemphasized. Cannot. Um, it sounds so basic, but, but it is so key. <laughs> I know both uh, Columbia and, and Harvard in their prompts, that, and the questions are different, mm -hmm. but they both say something along the lines of, and I'm paraphrasing, Given what we know about you based on the rest of your application, mm -hmm. in Harvard's case, what else do you want us to know? And in mm -hmm. Columbia's case, it's okay, we know about your past based on what you've written elsewhere. Mm -hmm. What are you planning to do in the future? So right. in that essay, they don't want to know what you did in the past anymore. They already got it. And they they're really pretty clear it. about it. Yeah. And in the Harvard one, what they're saying, how what new information are you giving me? Right. That's right. <laughs> how are That's you right. complimenting? your application with the 100%, essay. Yeah. 100%. Thank yeah. you. I'm so glad yeah. you highlighted that and brought it up. It's very like often missed over, I think. Right. Yeah. And I think the other thing in terms of the statement of purpose or the goals essay for MBAs is it's, it's quite a contrast from the personal statement that people might have written for undergrad. And this is, by the way, true yeah. also for medical students. It's different from the personal statement you wrote for college. And the residency essay, by the way, is different from the essay that you wrote for medical school. You're already a doctor. You're no longer writing about why you want to be a doctor. You might be writing about why you want to be an ophthalmologist or a cardiologist or whatever you want to be. But it's, it's much more of a forward-looking essay. Absolutely, because that's what you're doing. You know, again, it speaks to the professionalization, the point of these schools besides the knowledge is the professionalization as well. Um, right. And with an MBA, it skews much more towards the professionalization and some of the more professional degrees. And really, yeah, they want to see that you have a sense of what you're going to be doing with your time there because it's mostly not classes. Right. Uh, well, interesting enough, HBS, mm -hmm. while it says don't repeat, and doesn't literally say don't repeat what's in the other rest of the application, <laughs> but that's, pretty much what they're saying. It's, it's what else would you like us to know? Uh -huh. They're actually less interested in, in the future. They want to yes. know what else in your, in your past would in you like past. us to know? And maybe the present and future will, will play a role. But it's the, the point is, again, as you started off, the very first thing you said, mm -hmm. read the prompt. Read the prompt. Yeah. And even still, like when you're talking about your past, 
you know, I always, you know, so if I work, I'm working with undergrads who are applying to scholarships, so sure. their undergraduate career, and I start talking a lot about high school, I go, well, did you do anything since then? So, um, so it's, it's not just anything in the past, too. It's also, right. it's more recent yeah. past. Exactly. So what did you do in your last business job? What did you do that's that you're going to bring to the table that's relevant to to the program? Yeah, absolutely. Vanessa, it's been delightful talking to you. I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. (laughs) My pleasure. My pleasure. Listener, if you would like to work with Vanessa Febo and take advantage of her expertise in editing admissions and scholarship applications, we're going to include links to her bio and contact me page in the show notes at simba.com slash 473. I also want to thank you, listener, for joining Vanessa Febo and me for our 473rd episode. If you find the show worthwhile, I have a suggestion for you. Subscribe. That way you won't miss any of our future shows, whether we're the admissions directors, fantastic admissions consultants, Mm -hmm. test prep pros, or alumni doing great things. You can find the subscribe links in the show notes at, you guessed it, exhibit.com slash 473. Quick reminder, master the paradox at the heart of graduate admissions by downloading our free guide, Fitting In and Standing Out, the Paradox at the Heart of Admissions. Grab your copy at exhibit.com slash F. I-S-O, as in fitting in, standing out. Again, that's exhibit.com slash F-I-S-O for the free guide, fitting in and standing out, the paradox at the heart of admissions. Thanks again for coming. This is Admission Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I'm your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week.